You know, there are few things more central to, to the Christian faith and yet more complicated than mission. We know that we serve a missional God, the God who sent his very son to come into the world, to live for the world, to die for the world, to rise for the world, to redeem the world. We know that we serve a God who through the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to give the world life. We know that we serve a God who is coming again to make all things new, to redeem his world forever. We serve a missional God. And because we're made in God's image, we recognize that we are a missional people. We are a people who are sent out bearing the message of new life in Jesus Christ. We are a people that are made in the image of the God of mission, and therefore we are people that are sent on mission in the world. And yet, many of us feel worn out, depleted, frustrated, and cynical on mission in this world. Many of us experience, you know, a life of mission early in our lives. You know, we experienced maybe a big tent revival, or when I was in college, we shared the four spiritual laws with people. Did anybody else do that? Four spiritual laws, that kind of stuff, campus crusade. However, if you talk to campus ministers today, or to young life leaders today, or if you are alive at all today, you recognize something. Our missional landscape has shifted things feel substantially more complicated. Billy Graham revivals aren't seeing half the city converted anymore. And we wonder, what does it mean to be on mission today? We ask the question, has God changed? Has the mission changed? How are we supposed to engage the shifting world? And many of us have just given up a life of mission. Well, today, as we engage in, as we continue in our sermon series on the life of the beloved and the practices of the beloved, I want to remind us that as the beloved of God, as disciples, we are all people sent on mission. Yes, it feels like the soil that we are in right now is quite rocky, but that does not change our identity. That does not change our calling. That doesn't change who we are to be a people of on mission. And so today I want to look at Acts chapter 20, Paul's farewell address to his beloved church in Ephesus, a church that he helped plant. These are people that he helped bring the gospel to and raise up as leaders. And when he addresses them, he addresses both his past ministry, but also his future ministry. And I want to look at two things today. First, as a people called to mission, we are called to absolute confidence in the power of the gospel. Absolute confidence in the truthfulness of the gospel and a confidence that leads to compassion that the gospel is actually the best possible news for a fallen world. First, we are called to confidence. And then second, I'd like to remind us that Faithful mission, faithful evangelism, faithful engagement with the lost world necessitates the building up of the church. The church is the culmination and continuation of mission in this world. You know, I did Campus Crusade all through college. I I spent so much of my time doing direct evangelism on my campus at Purdue. And people would think I was foolish or they'd love me and it rarely was anything in between. But everyone who we shared the gospel with, who made a decision for Christ, who did not connect with a gospel preaching church, did not stay in the faith. It is just as important that we look inward to the life of the church as we look outward, because faith is sustained and grows in the life of a healthy church. So if you would, turn with me to Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 21 or uh, 27, actually, 27. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. 
how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and affliction await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. You know, I love the sheer confidence of the apostle here. He knows that imprisonment and affliction and death are awaiting him, and yet he is compelled by the goodness of the gospel to go forth regardless. And he uses a couple powerful phrases. He uses the phrase shrink back twice. Uh, In verse uh, 20, he says, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. Do we still believe that the word of God is profitable in people's lives? that it actually is the good news that will actually transform them and give them what they're actually longing for. In verse 27, he says, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Do we actually believe that all of God's word is good news for people? Or do we want to help God out and cut out those bits that we think the world can't quite hear? And then in verse 24, he says, but I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I finish my course in the ministry I've received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The apostle Paul genuinely believed that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace, isn't just some good news among good news. We have plenty of good news in the world. There are plenty of good things happening. There's plenty of bad things happening. But he didn't think it was just some good news. That it happened to be some good advice for people that if they happened to heed it, they would have their best life now. No, he believed it was the best possible news. It was the word of grace that every human heart is longing for. It was the word that can actually bring dead people back to life and sustain them in life forever. But I know what my temptation is. My temptation is to waver in my conviction that the good news is actually the best news. And I know in my temptation, and I'm sure yours is too, is that we have to help God out a little bit and make his news just a bit better from our perspective. We have to make his good news just a bit, you know, more palatable to our world and then more people will become Christians and then we'll feel good, right? And I think in our city, especially, you know, we can talk about the church broadly and that rarely does anything good other than build resentment. In our city in particular, I think there are two ways that we try to help God out. One is the prosperity gospel way. And that, that says something like this, you know, all that desire you have in your heart for success, for health, uh, to be the top of the pyramid in some way, yeah, you don't have to die to that at all. God actually wants to give you all of those things. It's a gospel without a cross. It's a gospel without a death. It's new life without going through death first. And then what ends up happening though? You don't get those things. Life doesn't turn out the way you thought it would. That person that you love so much doesn't get healed. And then what happens to people? They lose faith in the God of the prosperity gospel because that God doesn't exist. That God doesn't answer those promises. That God is a false God and false gods will always let you down. And then what happens? We 
appropriated the gospel, amended the gospel, edited the gospel so that people could receive the gospel. And then they, in the long term, reject the gospel because it was a lie the whole time. And we do this. On the other end, what we tend to do is we have the modernist gospel, which says, you know, all that teachings of Jesus stuff, every bit of the Bible stuff, ah, we don't really need that. What you really need is Jesus is your therapist. Jesus is your pal. Jesus is your best friend. Jesus is the one that will endorse all of your actions and all that law stuff. We can completely get rid of that because people can't hear that. But then what ends up happening? People spiral into greater and greater sin and it actually destroys their lives and the lives of those around them. Because shocker, as we're seeing in our world and we're seeing in our own lives, sin is actually for our bad. Sin is actually for our destruction. And when we preach a gospel that says you don't actually have to bend your knees to Jesus, you don't actually have to wage war with sin, you don't actually have to come under all of his commandments, not just the ones that you like, guess what happens? The world spirals out of control. Our lives spiral out of control. and We aren't actually given that new life that Jesus promises. We do this, don't we? We think that the good news of the gospel and the proclamation of the lordship of Jesus is just too hard for people to hear. So we try to help God out by cutting out bits here and here, amending things here and here. And then what ends up happening? They serve a Jesus that doesn't exist and that Jesus lets them down. Fitzsimmons, Allison, is a, he's got a great name, um, but he's a bishop in the Anglican church and, he, and he's Southern. He's got a great book. It's called The Cruelty of Heresy. And, you know, when he talks about it, it's pretty amazing. But The Cruelty of Heresy, and it's a great book because what he talks about is how every heresy was basically like, hey, God, let me help you out a little bit for the sake of mission. And then what happens? It ruins people's lives because it amends who God is. It amends who they are and there's no true gospel. Here's what I want to communicate. The first step in evangelism and mission is recognizing God doesn't need our help to make his news any better. His news is already the best possible news. What he needs is for you to fall back in love with it. What he needs is for you to submit fully to it. What he needs for you is to have a confidence that it is the best possible news for the world today, yesterday, and tomorrow. The good news doesn't change with a changing world. The good news is what holds a world together. Because what ultimately is it? What ultimately is the good news? What is the good news of the gospel? It's the thing that fulfills the longing of every human heart. First, the good news communicates that longing that each of us has for unconditional love. All of us want to be loved. All of us want to be seen by someone and not have them turn their face away when we don't match up to what they expect. But what does the gospel communicate? That if you're wrapped in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, the Father can look upon you and he doesn't turn his face away. That doesn't lead us to licentiousness. That doesn't lead us to sin. Rather, it grounds us in the reality that God chooses to unconditionally love you because he unconditionally loves his son. And that is a news that crosses every culture, that crosses every time, that crosses every person, the longing to be unconditionally loved by the one who can infinitely love us. And a human heart will never be satisfied until it experiences that unconditional love of God. That doesn't need you to help it get any better. Not only that, but what else does a human heart long for? All of us want to be forgiven. I think that's one that we lie to ourselves and we say, well, our modern world doesn't think it needs to be forgiven because it's lost a vision of sin. That's not entirely true. The more that we try to convince ourselves that we have, don't have anything to repent of, the more we actually feel that deep malaise and fear that we actually do carry guilt that we thought we would get rid of if we just got rid of moral standards, right? It doesn't actually disappear. In fact, 
People are far less happy today. Depression is wildly increasing. People are, are entering into just a season of human existence and I'm not sure we've ever seen before. Why? Because they know they need to be forgiven. I know I need to be forgiven. I want somewhere to take my guilt. I want someone to take my shame away. I want someone to clothe me and cover over me. And I know I'm not the only one. And the good news of the gospel is this, that Jesus can take your shame away. He can actually offer you forgiveness. And the reason why he can offer you forgiveness is because he has a moral law that none of us live up to that leads us to recognize we don't live up to it. And then it compounds the gift when he takes away the consequence of our failure to keep it. When we try to remove the law, we actually remove the very thing that compels us and moves us to Jesus to take that weight off of our shoulders. This is actually what your neighbors are longing for. This is actually what your children and your parents and your loved ones that don't know Jesus are longing for. They're longing to be forgiven. And that can only ultimately happen in our Lord Jesus. That is such good news. You don't need to make it better. And then finally, I think we're all longing for purpose. You know, we thought that if I can just direct my own purpose, then I'll be ultimately happy. And as it turns out, that's not the case. We're longing for a king to tell us what we ought to do. We're longing for a story of the world to give us a framework so that we can actually understand how the world works because we know we can't understand it on our own. And the good news of the gospel is that we've been adopted as royal children with a royal purpose of having dominion and authority over the whole earth. See, that's actually the, the end of the story. That's where we are moving towards. That's the, the telos of this gospel message that because we've been adopted, we've been brought into the great story of God that gives us purpose and meaning in life. That's so good. You don't need to amend it. And so my prayer for you is first that you would have a deep conviction that the good news is the best possible news, but not only that, that your heart would be moved by compassion for those that don't yet know it. In verse 31, Paul says this, therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Is your heart moved to tears for those that don't know Jesus? Is your heart moved to tears for those that don't know that unconditional love that you know? That don't know that forgiveness that you know? That don't know that purpose that you know? I don't know who that person is in your life, but my prayer is that your heart would be reopened to them, that you might go back on mission to proclaim this news yet again, that it is the best possible news. But because we're running out of time, I wanna, I wanna move on and I wanna look at the centrality and the importance of the church for lifelong discipleship. All of us have seen it happen in our lives. Someone makes a confession of faith and yet they are not connected to the people of God. They wanna be a person of God without the people of God. And that never works out. Look back at verse 28 with me as Paul equips and commissions the elders, godly priests, godly men to oversee the church. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples from them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years, I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who are with me. In all things, I've shown you that by working hard in this way, 
we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You know, we're all responding to things in our life, aren't we? We're all responding to things. Um, Maybe we had a really bad father. And so we spend our life maybe questioning authority. That can be the shadow side of it. But it can also compel us to something good. It can compel us to say, yeah, I'm not going to do that for my kids. I'm going to love my kids. I'm going to see my kids. I'm going to be present to my kids. So often in our lives, we have difficult things in our past that compel us to greater action in our future. And for me, when we planted this church, I was growing increasingly suspicious of the missional church movement. Many of us were raised as evangelicals and therefore raised with a heart for evangelism. And what the missional church movement said is that the church is fundamentally a vehicle for evangelism. And so in my lifetime, I saw a couple different streams of this occur. You saw it kind of in the boomer generation with the seeker sensitive church, right? We're going to like sing songs that sound like the culture, preach sermons that sound a whole lot like, you know, a motivational speech of some kind, make church not feel churchy at all for the sake of reaching people, right? In my generation, it kind of became this angsty, woke, post-evangelical, you know, we're going to out social justice to social justice people, and then people are going to become Christians, right? Well, it turns out neither of those work super well. In my life, what I saw was, you know, occasionally someone became a Christian here or there, almost never through the ministry of the church, almost always through devout disciples reaching of someone that they cared about, almost always. But then what I saw was something interesting. Friend after friend after friend after friend deconstructed and left the faith. They became suspicious of the faith resentful towards the faith. They started to believe that actually the world was better at being Christians and the Christians were at being Christians. And they left the faith. Clergy friends of mine left the faith. So many of the people I graduated from seminary with are not Christians today, are angsty Christians that aren't Orthodox at all, or are enemies of the gospel. And how many of us have lived that? If you're beneath the age of 40, you've probably seen this over and over again in your life. And so what I started to ask was, something is off here. Our churches are not reaching the world, but the world is doing a great job of reaching the church. And I started to wonder if it was actually the result of our priorities, of how we did things, of our mimicking and parroting the world whether it was our sermon series or our actions or our music or whatever it was. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to plant a church that had the audacity to just be a church. I wanted to plant a church that had the audacity to preach to our children, not a a carefully nuanced gospel that basically loses all of its fangs and its teeth, but just preaches the historic faith that has been wise and true and honest forever as if it was wise and true and honest today. And yes, we have hard questions that we have to answer. Yes, we are living in a very different culture today than than Aquinas was or Calvin was or whatever. But at the same time, we're really not. The world has always been turned in on itself. And the wrong response of the church is to either isolate completely or to accommodate itself to the world. The church actually needs to have a unique language The church actually needs to have a unique set of rituals and actions. The church actually needs to have a unique coming of age process for children. The church needs to have a unique relationship with one another of grace. The church needs to be the church. And that doesn't actually close us off to the world. Rather, it actually gives us something different to say to the world rather than accommodating ourselves to the world. And what we see Paul doing here is recognizing that all of his evangelism in Ephesus would be for nothing unless he raised up godly men as elders and leaders in the church to protect the church against ravenous wolves that would tear it apart. 
And therefore, my prayer for this church is that, yes, we would be engaged in evangelism. Yes, wherever you go, you would have people in your life that you love and care about so much that you are opening up your life and your heart to them and you are proclaiming the gospel as not only a good news among good news, but the best possible news and that you would invite them into a place that's the last bastion of sanity in the world. The last place where people actually treat each other with love. The one place where people actually extend grace instead of judgment the place where we are actually called to a great moral standard, but we all know that we don't live up to it. And we can come and receive the Eucharist every week in words of forgiveness, that the church would actually be the church. Because here was my experience. We spent all of our time wrapping our minds around how do we mobilize the church to do something other than that? And we didn't reach people but they did a great job of reaching us. And all the real fruit of evangelism in our culture occurred when you all were living as Christians in your neighborhood, in your family, in your places of work, on mission at Young Life or in Campus Crusade or in a work ministry, that the church was strengthening its disciples to send them out to reach the world so that the world might come in and experience something utterly different. The world might experience a community transformed by grace. Don't ever forget that just as central of a life of mission is a life of building up the local church. And that doesn't just happen with you serving in our kids' ministry. That doesn't just happen with you giving to the church. This doesn't just happen with you, you know, filling all of the roles of the church. What that happens, how that happens, is for you to pursue Jesus Christ with your whole heart and to bring that transformed life here. So that when you see someone new, you actually are curious about who they are. So that when someone wrongs you here, you are actually quick to forgive as you have been forgiven. So that when I mess up, you still love me regardless. You know, that's why our church experienced coronavirus very differently. I've shared this with you over and over again. It's because you all chose to come to church and act like Christians. Instead of turning on each other, instead of blowing this place up, as happened again and again in our city. Why would anyone want to come and join that? Family, one of the greatest things that we can do as a church is to continue to pursue Jesus and build up a healthy church here and now. My prayer is that your hearts would be softened to the gospel, that you would be motivated by compassion and boldness in the truth of the gospel, and that you would continue to focus on building up the church because it is the place where discipleship is formed. Let's pray.